Computer Science presentation. This is an astronomy channel. channel. The, the supermassive, supermassive black hole has been dominating the astrophysics news for decades. The supermassive black hole, of course, exhibits gravity. What's that? What's that that's sucking space and time in that we can't see through because it's pitch black? Although if you look at artists' diagrams of black holes, it's not how they draw them. They don't just take a big bucket of black paint and just go, what? That's a black hole. <laughs> no, they draw it with like rings of fire. <laughs> the jets coming out of them, they don't care. There's a disc, an accretion disc. Oh my God. So this black hole is something else, man. I mean... I had to find out. I had to find out. Because I'm reading, you know, every day I'm out on the internet getting photographs. I made a database of interacting galaxies. This is going back a ways, but this is how I got into the whole thing. I love galaxies. I know. I'm a freak. I'm sorry, but, I mean, you got to live with it. It's like, I think everybody goes through this. They realize they're the chosen one for this, some freakish guy thing. They just see a snail and they just know every thing about the undergrowth in the forest. And they go on to write books and make movies. And it's just unbelievable. But I mean, a black hole is kind of like that, is what I found out. It's like, it's like, what the hell are you even talking about? It's a black what? A hole. I found out why it's called that. I did. Look, at, I, learned, I learned everything that they know about the black hole. And I'm here to tell you what they know. And the first thing that you have to know about what they know is it's all linear algebra. <laughs> Which you'd be like, of course, because all of science runs on linear algebra. Everyone knows that. So what's, what's special about it's the same as the rest of science? It's because it's linear. <laughs> and that just doesn't seem to work on the black hole. <laughs> and I found out why. It's because of something called a singularity. What would quantum gravity look like? If gravity were quantized, it could be shelled. As well as obtaining the known reciprocal effect of shelling. The shelling is seen in quantum geometry, which is the geometry of the Bohr atom. I think you're starting to see that this is just common knowledge. I'm putting it into a certain nomenclature and order. I mean, I'm presenting this, but none of this is unknown. It's just that I'm putting it in a way that I need to put it this way because you'll see why. You'll see why in a moment. But don't forget, this is one of the greatest paradoxes, one of the most amazing phenomena, and one of the hugest, most gigantic frickin' things we've ever seen. It is utterly fascinating in what it e even is said to do, which in a certain, a certain context cannot be denied that this freaking thing exists. But exactly how it exists or how we even know it exists, turns out to be an incredibly deep story. It just is way down into the how things are... We'll see. That's why I'm making this broadcast, is to talk about quantum gravity. I can say that I know what it is enough to tell you. But what you do with what I tell you is entirely up to you. You may know already something about quantum gravity. And if you do, goody two shoes for you. I know only what I had to find out as a tour guide, a low paid, a zero paid. I don't even actually have an, a clientele yet. But I like to imagine they're always there. I just go out on simulated cruises. I invite everybody along, obviously. I've made 300 videos 
in 10 months. And many, many tours of the universe interspersed because that's what I'm always trying to get back to so I can show you something which just so you know a little bit more about who I am you will be interested in seeing that and that is <clears throat> called ARP 273 and ARP 273 is named after one of my teachers Dr. Halton Christian Arp of the United States, Pasadena to be specific, until he was blackballed and drummed out of the industry and the country, and he ended up living in Germany. Uh, very understandably <laughs> slighted man, because um, this man's book called Arp's Peculiar Galaxies changed the perspective of an entire generation of astronomers in the street, people like you and myself. His book did, because of pictures like what you're seeing. And I'm one of those men, although I was a late bloomer. <laughs> but the point is, wouldn't you like to see more of those? Uh, it goes further than that for a scientist and astronomer who finds, I'll just put it this way, who finds him or herself attracted to what they're seeing in this photo, which I definitely did. I ended up looking at over 600 photos of things just like this in a special class into which these two fit. These are interacting galaxies. And it's very, very clear and just plainly obvious that they are not interacting completely due to gravity. They're interacting in more than a gravitational way. And that is well known now among those who know how to see. You can look at that thing, and of course I'm pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> you... <laughs> The ARP 273 is two very special interacting galaxies because I'm a classificational expert. One of the duties of a morphologist is classification. I'm a database engineer, that's how I'm in the industry. So that's not a physicist, okay? A database engineer is about as far from being a physicist. Astrophysicist? Well, that has the word physicist in it, so no. <laughs> but when you're giving tours and you run across something like this, the children may have questions. What the F are those? They may be teenage children. <laughs> but when we come to a black hole, obviously as a good captain... I'm going to steer around the goddamned thing because you don't want to get anywhere near a black hole. Because you could just suddenly find yourself drifting. I think we're near the black hole, but the computers are now howling at you. Unexpected increase in the gravity to the starboard rear and we're being pulled. It looks like we're not. There's no way out now. What? You've been sucked into the maelstrom. Maelstrom. That's an infundibulum. It's actually a water spout that's upside down. And you get sucked in your boat. Around and around and around. These occur off the coast of Norway. I looked it up. That's what you learn from trying your damn this to do what scientists do. You end up looking up a lot of stuff if you're me. And the Maelstrom is a black hole off the coast of Norway in the sea. And it just sucks you in and you don't come out. And the first thing, the very first thing, and this is what alerted me, is like every single time anyone mentioned a black hole and they wanted to say, like, you don't know what it is just in case they're going to tell you what it is. It's always the same definition. See if you can repeat it with me. It's like a Pledge of Allegiance. 
to the flag or, or some kind of prayer or incantation. Just light some incense. Just, just musk up the whole place because this is sacred holy. What the F is a supermassive black hole? And the person is, oh, I'm so glad you asked me. It's something from which, yeah, fill it in, fill it in. I'm not going to say it, but I'll just say it has to do with light. Light. Like whoever would choose to describe what this purely theoretical object is, in describing it to an innocent, just a person on your tour, I am not going to tell them what the what these astrophysicists say because it's obvious that they're out of their flaming minds because look what everyone says that they teach the people that they teach about these supermassive black holes what do the people that they teach say about it to someone like me or you or a kid or anybody who's just curious, what, what does that mean? The very, you have to say this apparently, there's no other way to describe this to a first timer. You have to protect your CYA. There's only one thing to say about a supermassive black hole if you're talking to someone who's not sure what it is. And you know the litany, you know what you must say. And it's about light. But why is that so significant? It's about gravity. It's about gravity. So that's our introduction to the topic, which is now right at the top of the list, okay, of all science. Put all the sciences together, go right to the top, astronomy, cosmology, the edge, the entire thing, the universe. What is that? It goes to that question. Because supermassive black holes form an enormous part of the universe. So if you're going to talk about the universe, you had better know and get it right if you care about your CYA, which you'd better now, because you don't want to get this one wrong. You do not want to get the definition of a supermassive black hole incorrect in any way. You have to actually know what you're saying, or you say, one thing that is CYA in science. And that's, we do not know what that is. And that's safe. And that's scientific. Unless you know. But that is a big unless. You'd better know on this topic, you're not allowed to slip on a banana peel. Oh, did we say that it swallows light and can't let light out? You'd better be goddamned sure of that. Goddamned sure of that. Well, I disproved that. So that's our introduction to quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is the Fermi edge of science right now, which is a subjective way of saying the cutting edge. <laughs> I don't like the term cutting edge. I like Fermi edge. The shelling seen in quantum geometry is the geometry of the Bohr atom. If you don't know what the Bohr atom is, good. Space shells are quite baffling. In fact, paradoxical. And I just completed a three lecture series on a great paradox, including an entire explanation 
for what is a paradox, which you don't hear very often, but that's my specialty, is telling you important things that you just don't hear very often. So the Bohr atom exhibits quantum geometry. So whatever you're talking about, when you say quantum gravity, it's going to have something to do with the Bohr atom. Otherwise, you don't know what you're talking about when you say quantum. Because when you say quantum, I know exactly what you're saying, even if you don't. You're talking about a sphere. And you use linear geometry on it. I don't believe there's any physicist or mathematician on the face of the earth that would argue with what I just said. The quantum is a sphere and we use a line to measure it. And then we wonder why our numbers break going in. It's actually totally predictable that they would. If all you can measure is a straight line but you're measuring the diameter of a sphere, then you can't even see that sphere at the smallest scale. Because whatever is the smallest scale for the straight line you use, it's never going to be long enough to measure the sphere. And so your linear measurement is not going to be able to measure a spherical reality and so your line is not quite real unfortunately though that's the entire number system of astrophysics is linear numbers a linear number has a limit that's linear but spherical space, which is the universe, at least at the Bohr atom level, it sure is. At the Earth scale, it is. At the solar scale, it is. And we have no reason to believe that the universe is anything but spherical to the same proportion that the Bohr atom is spherical. And Einstein certainly backs up that theory, nothing of what I'm saying is my idea. I'm just stating it in a different way than people are accustomed to hearing. Quantum geometry is very well understood. You would think so is gravity. How do we understand gravity? Do you know? You would have to know, at least to be able to say what the storehouse of knowledge for all humans knows, called science. What does science know? What is science? According to my definition, it's what we can say that the universe says. And if the universe says it, and we agree that the universe does say it, that is science. But it begins with what the universe says. Now, we would make no progress in science if we did not try to guess. And we've always been guessing. We always will be guessing. It's only a question, at what threshold are you guessing currently? And so we guess, and we continue to guess. But as you might expect, as you begin to reach the limit, which limit? What limit? Well, I discovered and explained in the last five or six lectures, actually the last about 150, there are two limits. Well, actually about the last 80. There are two infinities. And that's well understood now. You know how I can say that so confidently? Have we found the center of anything yet? 
well, where have we looked? Well, we would have to look at something that makes a center. Well, you have to get down to the atomic scale before you can find that. You might disagree. You might say there are planetary scale objects that create a gravity. Yes, but there are plenty of planets. There are plenty of suns. But if you're trying to get to the center, you're going to have to find it at the center of that. And you're going to get down to the molecular level. And then you're going to get down to the atomic level. This is for stars, planets, or the whole universe. You're trying to find the center of anything. What do you find? Do we find a center? You could say yes and you could say no, but you would not really want to get that wrong. Did we find the center? We got down to the atom, which has a center. So, okay, now we're on the snipe hunt. Can we find the center of the atom? That's called the nucleus. Okay, can we find the center of the nucleus? Yes and no. There is something inside the nucleus called a proton, and there's a footnote about the neutron, but we're just going to concentrate on the proton because that's what creates the space. And if, if you're shy or you're feeling embarrassed now, you can't go on because that's too difficult, then let me water it down a little bit. All of this is known. I'm not making up any of this. But the Bohr atom at, at whose center is the center? Yeah. Well, what's inside that? A proton. Okay. Is that the center? Yes and no. You notice that we're already encountering what I predicted. Science does not like yes and no. We need, we need an answer, okay? Is there a center to the damn proton then? You know, you start to get, come on. And, you know, if it's up to me or my team and we're standing, we're starting to shake in our boots. This is the boss. He could blow his lid and just send us skating right now. Are you going to answer my question as your leader right now? Or am I going to can you and get another team that will talk to me straight? Did you find the center? Gelman did. And we blame it on a Jew, of course. That's the first thing you do because Gelman is perfectly willing to be blamed for this. And he, and every, he got a Nobel Prize for it, so I guess he did okay. So he, he said, he gave the answer. Did we find the center of the proton? Yes, Gelman did. Well, what is it? In order to answer that question, Gelman went to Lewis Carroll, whose actual name is Charles Dodgson, and he literally just pilfered. This is not unknown, by the way. <laughs> he pilfered a word from fiction. It's not even fiction. It's like the lowest form of fiction. I don't know. This is Alice in Wonderland. Y yes, exactly. The quark. And that rhymes with lark. So it's quark. An American cannot say that. We say quark with a big fucking long O. Quark. And then the British say, they don't, I, I, don't, I haven't heard anybody been, who has been twitted for this, but I have read shit where repeatedly I read this. Where it's okay, I would, because you're safe. You're just saying, if you want to be specific, it's actually... And I can't say it, because I'm an American. <laughs> but it rhymes with lark, 
And I can say Lark, so I don't know why I can't say it, okay? But I can't. Because I've been told I can't, and I hear it, and it's true. And so that doesn't make sense? Well, there are a lot of paradoxes in life. And finally, I have to just go, this guy picked up this, this nonsense word. It's literally a nonsense word. From a guy who's writing, he says, right? This is nonsense verse. And then he comes up with a word that nobody in Anglo-Saxon or anywhere else has ever used or pronounced unless it was by accident. Inconceivable, but, you know, not zero probability. Quark. There, I did it. Qua. Quark. It's a quark. Well, okay, is that the center? Yeah, there's three of them. There are three, and that's the center. So, if you do not think that that is a paradox, then I would have to re-explain to you that yes, it is a paradox, because a center is a one-component thing. It's not a ball-bearing three-component thing, like a dingleberry dangling from your rear-view mirror. It's not... There's three. Well, okay. It, uh, and here's the final question, the test question. Is there an effing center to the quark? And now we get an answer. I got this. I had to pry it out of them. I had to hold one of them down, and I had to hold many of them down till they just, I had to do whatever I had to do to make them talk, and they couldn't because they didn't know, and I had to let them go, and then find someone who did the hell know, and do the same thing to him to get him to talk, so as to convince me, which is not going to be easy, It's like, okay, I understand it's a fantasy word. You remember the original question we walked in with? Did you gall darn dolly well find the center? And now it's three, three. And you're saying, yeah, that's what Gelman discovered. Okay, good. So, let's take one of them. That, oh, no. I mean, you know what happens now. You mean an up one, a down one, an anti one, or a posy one. And it's like, what? There's flavors. There's charms. There's... There's flavors, charms, and colors. There's strangeness. And I'm like, what? What? What are you saying? Well, you asked about the quark. Yes. Have you isolated it so you can get its radius? And finally, I mean, I had, I, I tapped the guy out and had to wake him up again. Okay, let's start again. And then he fessed up. And I got it. I got it out of one of these bastards. I, I made them say it. Did you find the center? Is it in the quark? Have you isolated the quark? No. What? No. I let him go. I even gave him some money to help him on his way. He didn't need it, but it was just, I, I tip. I, I, I must just let it go. He gave me what I wanted. The others were never heard from again. <laughs> That's just how it works. You don't know, but you said, well, I think you know what happens now. And then I say their name, and they have to go, yeah, you have to do what you have to do now. And yeah. And look for someone else who might know, who's willing to talk as if they do know. What is the hellacious center 
of a flamacious quark or whatever you call it, do we have a center or not? The answer is no. And here's why. Because in the Hadron Colliders, and I checked, I didn't crawl into a Hadron Collider. I didn't ask for time. I didn't go visit them. I just wrote what, I, not wrote, read. I read what they wrote about what they were doing because everyone wants to know. It's not like just the government. We all want to know. Well, I do. I'm just saying I've come that far from just giving guided tours of the universe. Just a humble doc... I just hang around the docks of, you know, the large Magellanic cloud, just looking for someone to hire me on as a, a tour guide, just trying to scratch out an intergalactic living. And now look at me. Have we found the center of the quark yet? And I'm even pronouncing it right. And so they can't isolate it at CERN or anywhere else, and they, they never will, and they know that now. And so Gelman, what, what's Gelman's response? They can't isolate the goddamn subparticle that you got a Nobel Prize for. He's like, I know, I never said, I never said you could isolate it. I just said it's a particle, because that's the only thing you can call it. I'm reading this going, Gelman's clean. Let Gelman go. But bring the others to me right now. What did Gelman tell you, you sucks? He said, that's not the center. So what's the answer? These are the particle physicists at CERN. You know, you got to do Gedanken experiments. It gets crazy. We're at the edge. And so I ask him, have you isolated the flaming quark? So you can get its radius, so we know the answer is yes or no. And they said, we have not been able to isolate the quark. And I went, you guys are off the hook now. That is all I wanted. That's all I was asking. So, to come back here to Earth, <laughs> have we found the center yet? The answer is no. And so now we're prepared at least to address the question which has scolded physicists for over 300 years and actually longer. Is there a center? Yeah, that's a different question. It's not the center of the anything. It's just of anything at all. Anything at all. Can you get to the center? The answer is no. Not numerically. You can't get to the center of anything numerically. Why not? Because you can't get to the center of anything physically. Physically. That's physics. That's reality. Can you get to the center of reality? No. And since the universe is included under the scope of reality, because it's all we can see or know, then the answer to the question, is there an edge to the universe? Is there a beginning to the universe? Is there an end to the universe? Is there a center to the universe? All four questions. No. And that's what we learn from the supermassive black hole. Again, what did we learn from the expert opinion on the supermassive black hole? Well, to answer that question, you have to know what the current model is of the supermassive black hole. Do you know what that is? No, you don't. Even if you 
think you do because it's linear 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 algebra the supermassive black hole phenomenon is not linear it's spherical and that means that your linear number system breaks just in the exact same way that it broke when you tried to get to the center you can't do either one you can't get to the edge and you can't get to the center with your linear numbers because the edge is not linear and there's more you can say you can't reach it with linear numbers whether it exists or not you still can't reach it for the same reason you can't get to the center of anything it's because your number system already has a center what number is that it's zero that's why nothing makes sense there is no zero except in derivative space because linear space as i proved in 2022 and it should be self-evident to you when i say what i proved linear space with the linear number system and everything that's in science right now including albert einstein's linear formulation of space-time is linear which is the derivative system and your derivative system will never penetrate the universe at either scale because you're crippled with earth numbers and you worship them but you shouldn't because if you are going to worship any numbers at all for the same purpose and to the same degree that you currently worship your zero based your zero centered space time zero that's the black hole and that's also the big bang and that's the linear solution to the universe congratulations you got as far as you could ever get with your linear numbers and now you know why you failed you need spherical numbers and you're going to have to start with me and god does that make me happy not because i get any form of vengeance against liars that i don't like who should not be doing what they're doing but do it anyway what this means for me is is that i can talk to people who come from the same stratum that i do they <clears throat> just want straight goddamn answers just tell me what you know you never want to lie to that man don't ever tell him that you already know but if it becomes ingrained in your club system that you have an expanding universe then you're going to get someone like me eventually who doesn't like your little game I hope you are having a blast we have all the answers now because of this geometry this changes the way science will be conducted it absolutely change, changes astrophysics the quantum mechanical paradox is now penetrated this needs to get out right away to every human being who can read and this is top priority on the earth right now what I just discovered 
So you're the first, and now it's up to you. Because I am not going to lift a goddamn finger to publish this. Further than what I'm doing. It's up to you now. I have 17 subscribers. I don't get any comments. You're going to have to start reacting. Or not. I give it a 99.9999999999% chance that this is going nowhere. And if so, that's the best for me, is for this to go nowhere. What would I would pray, though, as I depart this earth, you steal it. Steal this. And make it Make it run. This is Anna Galactic. We'll be right back.